What is your name? Robert Emmett Pertzel. Okay, this is the Biographical Information and World War II Veterans Oral History Project. Uh, Robert Emmett Pertle, my uncle Gus Pertle, and the interview is Commander Edward P. Seabald, Edward Pertle Seabald, United States Coast Guard, and today's date is July 14th, uh, 2002. Uh, Uncle Gus, uh, can you just tell me where you live now and uh, what branch of the service you served in during World War II? I'm still living in South Buffalo at 16 Shenandoah Road, uh, branch of service. A few years ago was um, the U.S. Army Air Corps. Now, do you recall um, when you were growing up and you were 16, 17, 18, where did you live at that time? Just across the creek on the Seneca Street side of Taz Park, 84 Parkview Avenue. 84 Parkview Avenue? And so you grew up on Parkview Avenue. Right. And you went to high school where? The old Buffalo Technical High School. No longer, it's since merged with others. Now what, now, what year did you graduate from high school? Well, 1944 was my graduation year. Now, when did you go into the U.S. Army? About two days after I left high school. I actually never saw the, my, my class was going to graduate in June of 44. I had passed my regents, I believe there were two of them, maybe civics and English or history, something like that. I had passed them in January, so I could actually get a, a city diploma. I was qualified for that. I was called to service in April, and the, I never made it to June for the graduation. <laughs> I wound up with a city diploma. So now when you, now you went to service, now you were living at home with your mother. Right. Helen Pertle, and any brothers and sisters? Eddie was, I had one brother, he was in the service. Uh, I don't know if it was boot camp or, I have no, I'm not, don't recall just where he was stateside in the Marine Corps. The only brother. Any had, sisters? Let's see, yeah, I must have had three, yeah, three sisters at home. My oldest sister may have been, at the time, she may have been down on the farm taking care of my grandparents. I'm not too so sure. Your of sister that. Bib. My sister Bib, yeah. And yeah, then you had another sister. Sister Jean. Jean, now was she, she was a younger sister? Yeah, no, she was next in line. Bib was the eldest, and there was Jean. My brother Ed, myself, and then the baby Helen Ann Seabald. <laughs> That's my mom. So, in 1944, what was it like in the neighborhood where, why did you go into the service? country was at war for three years at that point, correct? It had to be, let's see, December 7, 41, uh, 43, so 43 and 44, it seems everybody was going in the service and uh, I, I in a group around from the neighborhood, maybe a half dozen guys, signed up for the, it was like an Air Corps Reserve. You could join at 17. And that was to avoid being drafted into the regular army when you turned 18. So we selected the Air Force, thinking of course we were going to be pilots, 
officers the whole smash and avoiding uh, drafting into the army. Well, as it turned out, uh, come April, I had turned 18 and they called me. I believe I was in the re reserve from, say, October 43. And uh, we'd, we'd go up to one of the armories maybe once or twice a week, and we'd be drilled by the CAP, the Civil Air Patrol. We had uniforms and uh, inspections, and it was once or twice a week affair. Didn't amount to an awful lot, but uh, from those Rasters, they selected their enlistees. Now, did you, so in April, were you enlisted in the Army Air Corps? Or were you drafted? I, would, I was, in April 44, I, I was enlisted. Uh, to active duty. It says something on the, on the, my discharge papers that uh, it was an enlisted reserve corps from, April, from October 43 until April 44 when I was activated and sent to camp. Now, now when you left Buffalo, you went to a boot camp, is that right? Eventually, we called it basic training. We were taken to a reception center. Uh, we got ourselves to a reception center at the out on the end of Long Island. I'm almost certain they called it Camp Upton. Now, was that only for well, the Army Air Corps or from all service? I think it was just Army Air Corps. We were only there two or three days, issued uniforms, maybe got some shots or something, and then put on a troop train that took us maybe five or six days to get the location of our basic training, which was Keesler Field, Biloxi, Mississippi. And we spent, uh, I forgot now, six, eight weeks, whatever it was, basic training. Now what, did, what, was, what was basic training in Keesler like? Do you remember any of the guys you went with, or do you remember what it was like? Was this your first time away from home? First time I ever rode on a railroad train <laughs> down to Long Island. And then the tube train from there to yeah, the first time I'd ever been any further away than uh, Wellsville, down on the farm. Were you scared? No. It was tickled pink to get out of high school and in the service. And what was it like on the troop train? Everything was new. I was 18 years old. Almost everybody there was the same age, give or take a year or two. And uh, it was all new, everything exciting. Good food? Uh, no complaints. Uh, now, so you had all your uniforms and everything in a sea bag or in a... Uh... We're w wearing... Wearing dungarees and everything else was, uh, yeah, I guess you'd call it a duffel bag. And when we arrived, Keesler Field, I don't know, it took us three or four days. Uh, we had to change into the Class A uniforms before we got off the train. So we had to march through the <clears throat> the camp to our, we went to a tent city. 
and we had a march through in the, well, it was April, and it was hot during the day. But um, it was cold at night. And that's about all that was basic training was. I'm sorry, that was uh, timed out for some reason. Can you go back to Howard? What was his name? Howard Horn. Howard Horn? He lived in the Seneca Gaznovia neighborhood. <clears throat> And he and I took the same train. Geez, I can't think of the railroad station right now. Out of Buffalo? Yeah, it's, it was across. That's okay. Across from, from uh, the auditorium. Uh, and did he go to boot camp with you? Yeah, he, he was in basic training. It happened to be in the same tent. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I had some trouble with, uh, with uh, how the hell was it? Uh, oh, uh, I got sick or something. I don't know. I developed a bug or something because when we left, when all these fellows that were with me that had gone into basic training at the same time, when they left to go. To South Dakota, I was held back, avoided the gunnery school, and uh, eventually wound up overseas with the uh, 20th Air Force, flew nine combat missions, got back to the States in one month and 26 days, and these guys were still in gunnery school. The guy, the Vic, uh, Cleese, and Howard Horn, they never left the States. They were I believe school. not. I believe not. So you, I lost track. So you got, you sat there. On my horseshoe. On your horseshoe. And you finished up, you finally got out of radio school. Yes. And well, then what happened? What, what was it like? You graduated, obviously, right. from a new set of orders. Right. So then what happened? I'm not sure where we... I can't recall the towns, but I think they might have sent us to Kearney, Nebraska, to select crews for the B-29 program. That was in Nebraska? I'm not sure. I, uh, I'm not sure now. I remember having been there. Uh, at some point, but eventually we wound up at Clovis, New Mexico for the flight training in the B-29. So now are, are you, when you go to training, do you go with the same crew in the, that you're going to fly the aircraft with? Uh, supposedly, yes. But through the few months of training, uh, changes are made. Uh, in our case, of our crew, I think there were something like uh, six enlisted men, and <clears throat> five officers, and uh, our our flight engineer. Uh, uh, a non -com. Your flight engineer? He had a, a buddy who came, he ran into in the service from his old hometown in Brooklyn, and they arranged to swap. He was a waste gunner on, on uh, another crew. <clears throat> and our tail gunner wanted to get on that crew. So they did arrange a swap. So now we had the two buddies in our crew, but instead of the waist, he was, he had to fit his 200 pounds into the tail gun 
of the B-29. Is that small? Larger than the older ones, but uh, preceding planes, but uh, well, they were small. I would have had no trouble back there. Would I? Oh, yeah, I think you would have had trouble. <laughs> nah, so, that, so what is this? So do you remember any of those guys' names, those uh, the guys in your crew? Oh, yeah. I've got a picture with all their, their signatures on them, but uh, the skinniest little, uh, well, see, in, in this program, uh, we didn't have pilot and co-pilot. We had airplane commander and pilot. Our, officers always yeah, have to have our airplane commander was a Hector Doughty, D-O-U-G-H-T-Y, and the, the, the guy had spent uh, time before as a flight instructor. And God Almighty, he could land that plane. Sometimes I was on the radio asking permission to, during training asking permission to land. We're already on the ground. He could set it down like a feather many, many times. Uh, I could remember some of the other. I know Vinnie Neefus was, was that tail gunner I mentioned before. The big guy? Yeah. Uh, he wasn't overly huge, but he was a big man to crawl. He, he could get back there all right with his, his, uh, I believe he had a chest pack parachute. And uh, he'd get back there all right, the tail. Uh, Dick Fleming was his buddy, the flight engineer. Uh, was one of the gunners from Withyville, Virginia. Now the name had come to me, but it's it's not. Uh, I've got them all in, in the picture oh, no, someplace. Uh, so you, how long? So you were at the you're at flight school or at the B twenty nine school? Uh, yeah. Down, uh, uh, what they say, uh, back and forth, uh, Clovis, New Mexico. No, we started in Pio, Texas. Come to think of it, yeah, Pio, Texas. That's where we first started the, uh, hold on a minute. I've got a, I've got a log of all the time I spent in the B-29. Oh, okay. What, what I'll go in the other room and get it. Huh? Sure. I can tell. And you can keep your, put your glasses on like this. I want you to be comfortable. You know, if you feel yeah. comfortable as you read. So, so what was that Pio, Texas? Uh, I, I, we, we stopped for a second and you went and got a log. What is that log? It's... It's a... Uh, Log of the flying time that I had in the B-29 Super Fortress, mm -hmm. starting uh, at the base of first training Rattlesnake Army Airfield, Pio, Texas, which I guess is still on the map. I've seen it. <laughs> So now, what was it like when you're going up and training? Are you flying every day, or are you flying often? I was thrilled to death. Yeah, I generally flew every day. Now, that that B-29 was designed for high-level bombing, which never quite developed. So we were up 30, 40,000 feet. I think the highest we ever went, perhaps, was 45,000 feet in training. The little combat that I did finally get to, uh, we didn't do that. We were a lot closer to the ground for our purposes. And what type of, in the B-29, what type of weapons did you carry? Remember what type of bombs or? What was so beautiful 
about the B-29. I believe it was the first military aircraft to ever be pressurized. We did not have to wear uh, the heavy uh, sheepskins that B-17s and everything before us were required to wear. Uh, we could fly in street clothes, in casual clothes. It was comfortable? It was heat comfortable was... heat. And of course, we carried our, we had our jackets along with us, flight suits, but they weren't always necessary. We didn't have to be on oxygen at all times. We were pressurized. It was a beautiful feeling. So when you so you when you went and did this, this was a training in Texas. Yeah. So what were you training for? Were you training to work as a team? Or were you training as, as a crew? As we had, uh, well, take it from the front, the bombardier behind him, our airplane commander, the pilot. Behind, behind, behind him, the uh, facing forward, uh, the uh, flight engineer and commission, uh, and then right behind that, in many of them was a was the well, like the nacelle or the working part of a. Uh, uh, remote controlled four 50 caliber machine guns. And around the side of that was where I sat, radio operator with my tail on it behind me. He had a window, the uh, officer uh, the navigator. He was just on the other side of this. Uh, this uh, uh, gun and machine gun emplacement. He had a window, of course, and then right next to me was this tunnel, about 36 inch diameter, that ran, oh geez, I don't know how many feet, across the two bam bays, the top of the two bam bays to the rear section where the radar people and the gunners and the rest of the crew were. And right at the, the sit up in the end, I could sit up in the end of that uh, tunnel and there was uh, an astrodome on top for the navigator to uh, shoot the stars or whatever the hell we had to look at out there. Uh, that was nice for me because I had no window and any time I could get up and just watch the world go by, I couldn't see much, but one of the most beautiful sights I have ever seen in my life was sunrise over the clouds. God almighty. You never saw such a pure, pure white. Remember one time up there, though, uh, overnight, I had to stay awake to receive radio reports. We had radio silence, could not transmit, but to receive weather reports every 30 minutes. And uh, one morning it became dawn, and and uh, we're on our way back from uh, the Empire. And uh, I climbed up into this astrodome to see what I could uh, see going on. I looked over to the left side. Jesus, number one engine is feathered. I looked over to the right side. <clears throat> Number three engine is feathered. Well, I, 
I'm pretty sure somebody knows something about it. I didn't. <clears throat> sure enough, uh, we're running short of fuel. Enough so that both ends, uh, both engines shut down. But that's another story. We come out of it all right. Quite exciting. <laughs> we finally. I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, normally, had we been doing it, we would have stopped at Iwo Jima to pick up. Uh, to refuel, but we were in such good shape when we left the target areas that uh, we shot a straight beeline for Marianas and for Tinian home base. So here we were without a, you know, up the creek, no paddle. Uh, they had to just continue on toward the home base with our fingers crossed. And two Navy search and rescue planes following us. That was a little interesting to watch. We were ready to ditch. He was going to, commander was going to, he thought at first that if necessary, we would bail out and he would try to ditch it. Whatever, I don't know what the hell. A long time ago. But I knew these, uh, I think they called him a Dumbo. I think they called him a Navy Dumbo. Uh, it was like the, uh, the old Mars airplane, the big thing that looked like a there were two of them. One was the smaller Catalina. I think there was a PBY. Just waiting for us to hit the water so they could do their job. But eventually we landed at our home base and the third engine quit on the runway. It turned out that there hadn't been any errors on our part there's collapsed fuel cells in the wings. So we uh, took off with less fuel than we thought we had to begin with. Mm -hmm. well, let's, Gus, let's go, back, uh, let's go back now to Texas. You're finishing up your training, and you're going, you're training with your team, with your group, your air group. Yeah. How many people were on the B-20? It varied now. I'm, I'm trying to say 11. 11? And you like five, uh, five officers and six uh, enlisted men. And you were the radio operator? Yeah. Now, did they, the, the aircraft you trained on, is that the one, the same one you flew over? Oh, no. So those are just training ones? We're, yeah, we're, in fact, uh, Whatever they had ready on the line, whatever the ground crews had ready on the line, even in training, we'd uh, just use, just grab whatever's available. Mm -hmm. Like cabbies at their cab stand, I suppose, in the morning. Except there's 11 people at the island. Yeah. Now, when you finished in Texas, now where did you go from there? I think that's when it was Kearney. I mentioned Kearney, Nebraska, earlier. Okay, so you left Pio, Texas, and uh, now what? I'm just reading here. We went. We had a 10-day furlough. Went home. It was in June. Now I want to know where you went on that furlough. Back to Buffalo. So you finally for got ten home. ten days. 
Yeah, it seems to me I'd been on before that, too. But uh, it's not recorded here. This is just... <clears throat> so you came back home on furlough. Now, did you come home in your, in your uniform? Oh, yeah. So what did the girls think of that? Uh, I don't remember. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, I don't remember. I read something here. I discovered something which I have overlooked for a long time. And for the life of me, I can't remember what the hell I was referring to. For the life of me, I can't remember. Well, just read it. I just did. Finally left Texas behind us and went home for 10 grand days. 10 days in which I discovered something which I had overlooked for a long time. What to get back to flying. That's Wait a second. I'm going to pause it a second. Ready? Now. Okay. So you had furlough. And well, after that, that 10 day furlough, whatever, very vague in my mind, uh, somehow or other I got to Kearney, Nebraska. I believe that was the staging area. Getting ready to go overseas. As I see here, we spent a little time there and uh, headed for Sacramento. And I remember Sacramento, California was was uh, a kicking off spot. So that every year, like in Kearney, we had to break in a, a new airplane, so we'd slow time the engines. No, I don't even recall seeing Pearl Harbor in the next trip. J well, just excited about where we're going and what lies ahead. Did it take you a long time to get from the uh, United States to Pearl Harbor? It's funny you should ask. 11 hours and 20 minutes. <laughs> That's what's good about having a log, huh? From... from uh, Sacramento to John Rogers Field, in Oahu. Now, did they, uh, now how about from Oahu to Tinian? Well, we had to make a couple stops in between. That was June the 17th, I guess we arrived in Oahu. Now it looks here like the 20th, yeah. Left Oahu. Headed for uh, a tiny island called Kwajalein. I think it's in the... Uh, I think they call it, it's in the Marshall Islands group. And that's the first time we saw any... any sign of... No, I can't say that. Uh, uh, oh, it's, yeah, it's on Kwajalein that we found out we would be based on Tinian. So you went and then you flew on the Right, and you flew right. Guam. Took us 10 hours and 30 minutes to get to Kwajalein. We left there and headed to Guam, alongside of Tinian. just seven hours to get to Guam. 
from there short up to Tinian. And we gave up our good ship. Well, what do you mean you gave it up? Well, we were just couriers, just delivering it for whatever they were going to do with it. Now, can you, now, we, what, when you get to Tinian, what happens? What's it like? What's the weather? What's what is Tinian? tropical? Tropical island. Uh, that was what uh, the end of June. Of forty four or forty five. Yeah, end of June forty five. <clears throat> Well, that was all. Everything was new, new to us. We were housed in Quonset huts. They, it was hot. They were hot. Now, what's a Quonset hut? Well, you, you've seen them around. Uh, they look like, uh, you know, what do they call that? Uh, that thing they came out with the skateboards and the snowboards during the Olympics. The pipe, half pipe? The half pipe. Well, you just take that half pipe and turn it upside down. The Quonset hut was, um, I don't know, maybe invented by a guy named Quonset. But it was just a galvanized steel half pipe upside down. So you didn't have any, uh, you didn't have your own room? No, uh, there could have been, well, say, say six men to a crew. There could have been uh, four or five crews in one Quonset hut. So what did you have, a, a bunk? Yeah. A locker? A or? bunk, foot locker, and a bunk and whatever else you could manage yourself. Any furniture you could pick up. Mm -hmm. No, there was dormitory style bunks so next to each other. No air conditioning? No air conditioning. Uh, well, any fan that somebody could get. As I recall, it was it was rather temperate. Uh, I don't recall really suffering from it, but I do remember they had, uh, you'd be laying in your bunker playing cards or something like that. And <clears throat> of course we had cold showers, which were great. But they had to truck all the water in. Uh, I guess from a desalting, I don't know where they got the fresh water. But uh, tank trucks, water tank trucks would bring the water down for our showers in the latrine and so forth. And uh, they had to come down a hill and Quonset huts were all running alongside the road up the hill, and all of a sudden you'd hear the the air brakes from the truck, and somebody would scream water, and that cry of water would go all the way down the hill. Everybody would grab a towel and run, get in line for the water, for the shower. That that was great. So you took the shower right off the truck. No, no, he he, a he he filled a he filled an overhead tank, and uh, uh, we turned it on just like a normal latrine shower. Mm -hmm. No hot water, but nobody could give a damn because you didn't need it anyway. But and it happened once a day, so, oh, so we had good problems there. You go, yeah. Well, it was available. Right. How about? I think this is probably my. All right. Now you're on Tenny and you told me about the water truck. Yeah, that's after we were assigned to where our Quonset huts, where we would stay. Uh, but 
the first day or so in Tinian, we were in kind of a uh, uh, transfer section. Uh, we were housed in this uh, Guanza dot um, that was just for transients, as such as us. I went to the mess hall one morning, maybe the next morning, and uh, I was in line for coffee, and the guy behind me says, hey, Pertle. I turned around and I said, Jesus, Paul Murphy. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I don't know. This Paul Murphy was a buddy of my brother's. Uh, that age, he was two, maybe two or three years older than I. And here he was, Antinian, in this area, or in this squadron or whatever it was. <laughs> he had something like 23 missions. And uh, he says, where are they going to put you? And I says, I, I says, I don't know. We're just waiting for uh, to be assigned as replacements. He says, maybe you'll come to our barracks. We've had a crew missing for two days. Sure as hell, about a day and a half later, or whatever it was, I wound up in the same barracks as a kid from Seneca Street, about a, two miles from my home. And uh, we were bunk buddies there till I left. I left ahead of them for, for home. But How long that was. Well, he'd been there for 23 missions, I would say. It, it was, and I'm guessing at these numbers now, too. But uh, he could have been there several months. Uh, yeah, he must have been there several months. I've since seen him at home here. Of course, he's up in years, too. What else can we do? So tell me, all right, so you told me about the water truck. I think that's fascinating about the, you know, uh, the, the, the living account of it. Water. Now, where did you eat? How did you eat? What did you eat? What was it like? Uh, you know, was there a chow hall? What was? Antinian, I just can't recall. Uh, I can't recall if we used mess kits or not. What's a mess kit? Well, that's what the branches or the soldiers or would carry with them. A compact thing uh, opens up to, there's a handle that clasps off the top. Opens up to two dishes, like the cover and the bottom, one with a handle on it. And are you kidding me? What's a mess kit? You never no. saw one? Ah, geez, I used to have one here. And there's, an, I think, a knife and a spoon and a knife and fork. So then what would you do? You'd go? I'm not sure. I can't remember now. I, I would think, and Ginny and I would think that, yeah, there, there were mess halls. I'm sure there were. Because when we got back from a mission, they gave us fresh fried eggs. Real eggs? Real eggs. Only when you get back from missions. Everybody else probably ate powdered eggs or, or whatever. Well, then what did you eat when you were flying? You didn't eat for 11 hours? Or the... Uh, yeah, we 
They packed lunches. Uh, oh, geez, I, I find that. I know one time they tried to give you hot lunches. They set up some sort of a, almost like a, it wasn't microwave, but almost like a microwave oven that worked on electricity. That, that didn't work very long. But still, to, uh, most of them were cold lunches, like maybe a piece of fruit and uh, sandwiches. Or, I'm not really sure, as a rule, your beverage was your it was your uh, canteen of water brought from home. I can't remember on the plane how much running water there was. That's right. That's right. Let's, let's, let's move on to something else. What is that, uh, what is that American flag that you have? Uh, what, is this, what is that for? Well, you can just hold it up. I'll zoom in on that. These two. What's that? It was in one of the packets of our survival vests in case we were shot down or, or ditched or bailed out over the water. Yeah. Uh, we had the survival vests uh, with different, I don't know just what you would call it, um, Maybe a few snacks, uh, uh, these were in there anywhere, anyway, and somehow or other it was to tell anybody that found, found you, hopefully they were friendly and in four or five different languages here to explain that you were an American aviator an enemy of the Japanese. <clears throat> and, uh, you, uh, the uh, government of the United States would uh, probably pay you for uh, assisting us or helping me get back, get back or so that was just something you carried. It was just something I carried in the vest. Fortunately, never had to use. Okay, I got a good shot of that one. This one? You, yeah. you got this one? No, you just said, now what is that one? That's the well, I, I imagine it's the same thing. That's the Selling the same flag. thing, but it's, uh, it was uh, in Chinese for, well, the years of, the mid forties. Well, there's a Chinese in here too. That's okay. I just want to. I just want to capture that on, on the video. So now, how about these other two things? These other two items. You can take those. Do you remember what those were? If you can hold them up facing me. One's got a picture. What is that, Roosevelt or Truman? Harry S. Truman. Can you hold that face in me? I don't know where I got these. I don't know if this is probably in there. I really don't recall what these could have been. There's some Chinaman on the front of one of them. And uh, it's our president at the time, Harry Truman. Uh, I would think, I'm not sure, maybe these were propaganda leaflets mm -hmm. that we had dropped or could have dropped. I, so when you... I, I've lost track of those. Oh, that's right. So when you, uh, so you get to Teddy in. Now, do you remember what your first mission was like or what that was about? I've got it in the log. Okay, why don't you, why don't you take a quick look at you know, that will help you refresh your memory. Here, I'm going to pause it for a second. If you're on, you're we on left now. for Dinian. Hold the mic up, please. 
July the 9th, Leptinian for Wakayama, with a load of 33 500-pound fire bombs, left at 6.20 p.m. with the number of the ship. It says, good trip, no mishaps, no fighters, no flat. Returned 14 hours and 15 minutes later. I noted here that's one mission down, 34 to go. Is that what you're scheduled, 35 missions? Apparently, at the, at the time it was. But I'm still sitting on that horseshoe. Then the, what's this, the next day? Ninth, no, three days later. Left the base. To hit a primary target at Saruga. It's T S U R U G A. With ten tons of fire bomb. Yeah, fourteen hours and fifty minutes we were airborne. <laughs> On Friday the 13th, July 16th, heading for Kuwana with 4,500 pound bombs, which is, yeah, fire. A little flak, so a few <laughs> fighters. That was all. Thirteen hours forty-five later. Those were pretty much. I mean, those are just sterile log entries. Yeah. Do you, do you remember anything about any of your missions as far as what it was like? Uh, you know, being in the radio position, you can't see anything. No. Ah. Uh. In my uh, uh, right next to me was a, a door below this exit or this tunnel back and forth. Below that was the forward bomb bay, <clears throat> and uh, there was a door there with a window in it. Yeah, sealed, of course, a kind of depressurization. But uh, over the BAM, uh, after a BAM run, run, I'd have to tell the pilot that all BAMs were gone, were cleared, nothing hanging up. And I could do that through this window. Yeah. But one time, uh, there was only once that I ever had to tell him there was a hang up and, well, he got rid of it with just a salvo switch, I guess, whatever that amount to. The biggest scare I got was one time we were in, the Japs had radio, or uh, radar controlled searchlights. And Jesus, the minute we picked up they, the searchlights came on and followed us. And uh, I'm looking out to trying to see in the dark. I'm trying to see uh, if there's any bomb hang ups or anything like that. And uh, Jesus, all of a sudden, the bomb bay lit up like a ballroom. It was the searchlights. That scared me. But uh, nothing came of You ever attacked by any fighter aircraft? No. I think, along with that horseshoe, that they were pretty much... Maybe once or twice, but of course I couldn't see anything. I don't believe our gunners ever fired a shot. 
in the nine missions. I don't believe they ever fired a shot in combat. So these bombing runs that you went on, were they inside the Japanese homeland? Were they within the Oh, homeland? yeah. So you were actually bombing Japan at that time. Right. All these towns that I mentioned, Wakayama, they, these are on the map of Japan and the Empire. Uh, we, one time we took up um, mines. We mined a port. Uh, it says here August the 7th. One, when was the atom bomb? That was around the early part of August, wasn't it? Oh, atom bomb. Yeah, August the 6th was Hiroshima. And Nagasaki was the 9th. Now, in between those two, here's August the 5th. We, we took a, a load of uh, 2,000 pound mines to uh, mine a bay near that Saruga that we mentioned before. Day before, yeah. the bomb was dropped at Nagasaki. Yeah, here's, and we knew, at, we knew nothing of that atom bomb drop. They used to talk about it. I, I believe the Enola Gay was up on the, I think, say in, say in the north field, and we were on the south field. So they flew from Tinian? Yeah, they did. And uh, we heard rumors that, hey, there's something going on over there. This is before anybody had an idea of an atom bomb. They said they're working on something over there in the north field, whatever, that uh, one plane will take care of a whole squadron or something like that. And it was just scuttlebutt. And, uh, and conversation until it happened well, were you but nobody the knew field? no no we weren't anyway I had no idea I knew about I probably heard about the results of the atom bomb in Hirosh Hiroshima or, uh, the same way everybody else did there wasn't any CNN then, right. but uh, so after, just the radio reports. After the mission, <clears throat> back on the base, no one still knew that they just dropped a nuclear bomb? What? I can't tell you when, uh, when we first knew of it. Here's, here's August 1st, 45. We're going to mine another field up near Manchuria. We, we gassed up and with m mines, a long trip, <clears throat> they would put an auxiliary gas tank in one of our bomb bays and just carry uh, the payload in the other bomb bay. So this was going to be a long trip. So we landed on the way to the Empire. We landed at Iwo Jima for fuel and a meal and left there at 6.40 in the evening. Flew across the mainland to uh, this. We crossed the inland sea and dropped 12,000 pound mines in this field near, near Sashin, 
whatever the hell that was, near Manchuria. Oh, that was August the 1st. Oh, I made, I got my third stripe, made Buck Sergeant on the 1st of July. And that's, and that's where they ended. Now, August the 5th, we left the base uh, for this place near Saruga. Returned without any incident. And now we're ahead of schedule. It's August the 5th, August the 7th. I don't make, have any mention of August the 6th. So you wouldn't August the 7th, the day after we we went up to uh, up near the Shimonosaki Straits with mines again. Okay, hold on one second. United States Army Air Corps, 20th Air Force, 313th Wing, 504th Group, 421st Squadron, Sergeant, United States Army. An interviewer is Edward Pertle Seaball, United States Coast Guard Commander, active duty. Okay, Gus. This is my uncle, Gus. Where was I? This is tape two. So you so they dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and your your group was was not even aware of, of what was going on. We had to be, but I didn't know that here this was just a log of my t flight time. <clears throat> we had to have known about it. I know we we were because there's another deal here. We had always been flying at night time. And uh, generally it uh, it was fire bombs. <clears throat> and I guess the weather was too bad for daylight formation raids like the Eighth Air Force was doing in Europe. But the weather was going to improve in uh, over Japan or in that part of the world. So our crew was selected to go to a school for lead crew preparation for saturation daylight saturation bombing and daylight raids. Now referring to my horseshoe again, there were two schools. One was on the island of Guam, half hour away, and another was in California, USA. Our crew was selected to go to California. And we're, we couldn't even write home and tell about it. But uh, after Adam Bam at Hiroshima, we all thought, oops, that's the end of our ride home. We'll fall, they'll cancel this out, and uh, we'll follow everybody else if the war is going to be over. We were the last to arrive, we'll be the last to leave. But that isn't the way the Army works. Those orders were cut, and we wound up flying home to attend this school. As it turned out, they never ran the school, they didn't need it. But that was just another case of uh, I was at the right place at the right time. Well, how long after the bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki did you leave Tinian? 
It's right here. Uh, August the 11th. Hiroshima was August the 6th. Nagasaki, August the 9th. Here's August the 11th. They gave us an old uh, a war weary, they called it. Like we brought a brand new ship over, delivered it, the brand new ship over there. We were taking a war weary, they called it. Uh, back to the States for sh scrapping. And uh, we're, we're just hoping against hope that we get back home before orders are canceled. On August the 11th, we left Tinian. We had to follow the same route back to Guam, carrying a passenger. I forgot about him. I forgot who it was. That took about an hour. We and we left the same night, 9:30 for Kwajalein. Took seven hours. Did the passenger stay with you? I think he went all the way. I forgot. I wonder if he had anything to do with the bombs at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. No, I wouldn't think so. They were already dropped oh, at this time. Report. Oh, oh, I you don't know. What, what was the? Uh, did you have an aircraft number that you're flying? No, they it, they always changed. I mean. Like I said, whichever ship was ready, you took. Yeah, but in your log, you never, you never listed what the number was that you were flying? Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you left, any <sighs> Says here, I don't know, VG 2938888. Tail number? A war very that's either a VG or a V six two nine three eight eight eight. So you followed the same trail home. Same trail home. And you got back to California? Yeah. Went back to Sacramento. Left Mather Field the morning of the 14th. 14th of what? August. Via ATC, the Air Transport Command. We were hitchhiking from uh, Mather Field in uh, Sacramento. I remember coming across the northern part of the states. I think we stopped in Utah. I'm uh, I'm pretty sure we stopped at Chicago, maybe flew over Cleveland, landed in Buffalo. Well, hold on. I thought you were going to school in California. Uh, well, there was a delay in route. This was before. Maybe they gave us 15 days to get to the school in California. It only took us five to get home, so we had 10 days. Delay en route, they would call it. It's yeah. like a furlough. You went home for that time. Yeah, I, I flew all the way. And uh, I remember landing. Uh, that had to be, wasn't VJ night August the 15th? It may have been, I'm not sure. When they were celebrating, uh, because I remember coming through when they, they uh, I don't know, Chicago or Cleveland, or this is it. And uh, I remember landing in Buffalo, and I'm not quite sure where, but I think I walked down Cayuga Avenue or Cayuga Road. And at that time, um, 
there was a club out there, uh, Trap and Field Club, I think. And they were going crazy with celebrating. But I caught a cab. They took me to Parkview, carrying my bags, and and uh, I, you there. I walked up to the front door, uh, 84 Parkview, and rang the doorbell. I guess the dog barked or whatever. And I don't know. Just I don't remember what time. I know it was the middle of the night. And. Uh, rang the doorbell or pounded on the door and finally Nana came to the front door. She opened it up and says, Robert! <laughs> uh, Nana is who? My mother. My mother. Your grandmother. Nana Helen Pirtle. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Everyone wake up in the house? I can't remember who was there. This is the first she knew I was coming home. Before I left, I had sent a letter, but I beat it home. <clears throat> and I traveled those many miles. I, I don't know how many there were. I think it cost me a dollar and a quarter for the kid. Now, who was at home? Now, your brother Ed was at, he was still in the Marine Corps. I can't remember now. Uh, Helen Ann was a baby. Yeah, well, she was. She was still a teenager, right? 29, 39. Yeah, she was probably 16, 7. I think she's four years younger than I am. She was probably 16 or 17. So you had 10 days home. <coughs> what did you do? On Something your like that. Did you see old friends? Did you see old girlfriends? I really, I've really forgotten. Uh, I don't recall anything of... Hadn't like. changed. So it's not a lot of the names. I don't the recall. Gone, right? Oh yeah, Adam were gone. There. Now, did you have Only a few that we actually. I had to go back and report to this. Uh, advanced training school, the sleep training school. And I caught a flight back for that too. Or or did we drive? That might have been the time that this Yeah, that might have been the time that this guy uh I don't know, he was a captain something or other. He went down through the list of orders to the names. This might have been the time. And he called us up, he was gonna drive back. We were going to Muir Rock Dry Lake, California, for this training. And uh, he made a deal with me and some other non-com. Uh, we'd ride back. He bought an old Lincoln. And he figured on getting it out to California and making some money on it instead of taking the train or flying. That might have been the trip because uh, I don't remember all the details of that, but we drove and we took turns driving and finally got there. I think it seems to me, though, what? We were running out of money and borrowing from him. 
And it seems to me he came looking for me one time after we got to the base. I think I might have stiffed him out of eleven dollars or something. <laughs> Never heard from him since. I think that's the way we got back. I crossed the country a couple times with that ATC. Go to the airport and wait. When they'd find the <coughs> they'd get a cargo plane that still had room all you were was two hundred pounds, I guess. You were considered cargo. We could go practically any place uh, well the, wherever the plane was going. back to that school in California. The war was over. Yes. So then how did they discharge it? We had to wait for the point system. There was a point system. So many points for years of service, overseas service, whatever, maybe, maybe injuries, Purple Hearts or whatever, and, and maybe age was involved. Uh, they had to keep you there until the point system worked down to you so that they couldn't discharge six million people at once. So now what if you wanted to stay in, in the service? Oh, they encouraged that. All you do is, what they call it, re-up or ship over. And did they ask you? Did they uh. ask what you wanted to do? Why didn't you re-up? I wanted out. I wanted out. I, I didn't see anything that uh, excited me. And uh, I just wanted out. So when you, so they can't, how, how long after you went back to that school did they Well, from, uh, when did I get back there? Uh, that was around the 15th of, the end of August. September, October, November. Well, they held me there for another nine months, <coughs> doing practically nothing. And what did you do? I mean, did you... We swept the desert. We, we swept the sand in piles sometimes. They might send us to uh, classes to redo this. We learned that. Uh, I really. I really don't recall. Uh, occasionally, they'd come. Some of the uh, other uh, crews would come looking for it. They took, they took most of us off of flying status, which meant uh, on flying status, you get base pay plus, plus 50% in your monthly salary. And, well, after the war was over and this and that, most of the gunners uh, and maybe engineers were taking off a flying status. But every, every plane that flew had to have an MOS number, a radio operator's MOS number on their, whatever you called it, flight plan. So they come around looking for anybody with a radio MRS number, whatever they, um, say, hey, we're taking a flight to Florida. 
over the weekend. Would you like to go? Now they're they're fine for any other reason, but in order to, and I'm sure many of them, these officers were flying to get their flying time in, in order to get the uh, the, flight the flight pay. Nothing's changed and, in 50 years. But they they come around and uh, uh, look you up. As a radio operator, I took two of them, baby, but it wasn't my cup of tea either, and I didn't trust them. I figured I came through what I came through with the crew that they have, and I just didn't care to fly with anybody else. All they wanted was my number on the, on the manifest or the flight crew. I can't tell you what else we did. Uh, there certainly wasn't a lot of flight time. It's, we just waited and eventually they shipped us Fort Dix, New Jersey, and I was discharged. So Fort Dix was the processing point? Yeah, at discharge. So they discharge you, huh? and then you come home? Yep, yes. Now, how old were you when you came home? So that was in 46? It would have been uh, 21. 21. Born in 25, November. Yeah. So you get home. You've been gone for roughly two years. Yeah. The war. You come home. Do you feel you were different? I mean, you went away as a kid. I still felt like a kid. <laughs> now, what did you do when you got home? After the war, what did you, I mean, trying to get back to normal or back to regular life? Well, this. Uh. This buddy of mine that I mentioned earlier, Howard Horn, that I actually went down to, took the train, the first train ride with, right. and went through radio school with. He got a line on something, or his mother did. He was, uh, his mother was widowed, he was an only child. And she might have had something to do with the telephone company because Western Electric, I think they're the manufacturing and maybe installate, installation branch of Ma Bell, Western Electric, were uh, hiring. They were changing all the old uh, operator lines to the dial system. And uh, they hired a half dozen of us and sent us down to give us a few days training here in Buffalo and, and then sent us down to Elmira to uh, work as in the, that was the first job working in the telephone offices, changing over from, or putting in the dial telephone system. Mm -hmm. That didn't last very long because in the fall of the year, G.I. Bill, we started college. He and I both were up at UB. And uh, so we were only in, in this Elmira gig for three, three, four months at the most. You started school in the fall of 46? It must have been. Now, did you finish? Uh, did you get no, it? no. I had about two and a half years. I never really majored in, uh, in two and a half years' time. I, I was married and raising children. So when did I you dropped out of 
When did you meet Maria? Well, that was at a... Uh, I knew who she was. Uh, my kid sister, Helen, and her kid sister, Joan, were friends from school and this and that. I knew of her. And, uh, uh, oh, it might have been in 46, 47. No, maybe 45. No, it couldn't have been. Uh, oh, I'm through there. I went to uh, a, a friend's wedding, and I was tagged. And uh, this Vic Kless that I mentioned earlier in radio school, at grade school and at radio school, he and his girlfriend, Margie Albright, were also at the wedding. Well, I guess the reception was at the girl's home on Wyand Street, and uh, <clears throat> when it was all said and done, we were breaking up and going home. And Vic was driving his dad's car, and he says, uh, let's go someplace, and I said, ah, Gus, don't you have a date? No. She says, I know. Let's go down to Sears. There was a Sears right on, Se on Seneca Street, Sears and Roebuck store. He says, she said, uh, Marie then gets off of work at 9 o'clock or 9.30 or something like that. Let's go save him. So I said, hey, I'm game for anything. <laughs> that's the fertile thought. And, and that's, when it's, that's when it started. Uh, <clears throat> Keep talking. It's, uh, Margie called, Margie called uh, Maria. And she said, yeah, she knew who I was too, but through her sister. But that's the first time we normally, we, first time we got together. Now, what did you, uh, so you went out on that date with Vic? Vic and Marge and Marie and I, yeah. So where'd you go on your first date? Oh, gee, I have no idea. Oh, come on. No. I'm your nephew. No idea. As a matter of fact, I had been imbibing all afternoon since the wedding, and I don't really recall too much of that. That, uh, so, so when did I had a head start on Marie. So when did you get engaged? Oh, it must have been four years later. And then you got married. Now, where was you? Where did you? What year? What was your? When did you get married? January 1950. We snuck away. We were going to get be married, and uh, Christmas time was pretty much of an engagement deal, and. Uh, Figured we'd be married in the fall, late summer or fall. Well, then two of us decided, they, uh, let's do it this way. Well, I didn't have any money. But uh, we said, uh, we can elope. We didn't use that term, but <clears throat> we knew a priest out in Java right out there in, I guess, Wyoming County. He had uh, baptized the two of us over in St. John's Church on Seneca Street, and he had since become pastor out there. We went out and saw him, and he says, well, sure, he says, I can marry you. He says, but I'll have to tell Father Burnett, who was our pastor, 
pastoral privilege, they call it. He says, but I had dinner with him every Wednesday night, no problem there. So that's how it, how it came about. The only ones that attended our wedding was uh, my mother. In fact, the assistant priest over at St. John's, my par our parish, called me and said, you tell your mother. And he says, I don't care who you're surprising. Who else you're surprising? Father John Deneen. He says, I don't care who you're surprising. Uh, and you tell your mother she's had too many surprises in her life. She doesn't need another one. You tell your mother. He didn't threaten me, that, but he directed me to. So I did. And uh, that's all who attended. No brothers and My sisters. My mother, no brothers or sisters. Uh, Marie's mother and dad, and uh, who the hell else? Uh, I don't know. So, so we came back from the, uh, her parents gave us a breakfast out at, uh, uh, from Java, St. Patrick's Church in Java. Gave us a true breakfast for us at uh, Roy Croft Inn in East Aurora. Oh, yeah, I know this. And then we came home to her house on Birch Avenue over here in West Seneca, and uh, then we started calling up all our friends. <laughs> then you had the party? Well, they had a little party over at the house. We went on our honeymoon, and uh, maybe two weeks later, we threw a big bash reception up at the, uh, I don't know if it's still there or not, um, Grover Cleveland Clubhouse. Well, it's out now near where the Grover Cleveland Park is, near where uh, Veterans Hospital in Bailey Avenue. Mm -hmm. So you lived, so where did you go on your honeymoon? Mount Mar... Uh, I'm trying to say it. Um, Lake Placid. I was trying to say Mount Marcy. That was a hotel. Still have the key to it. <laughs> I think the place burned down and they rebuilt another one. And Mirror Lake. Yeah, from then on, it was nine months and eight days after the wedding. She presented me with the twin girls, Jane and Joyce. So they were, they were born in 51? November 50. November 50. Now, did the Korean War come in, into effect? Were they looking I'm not sure. Were? I never heard another word from anybody. And I didn't volunteer for anything since uh, my tour of duty in the, in the cook's car and the troop train. <laughs> so, no, so November 50, the twins, correct? Yeah. Now, where were you working at that time? I got off the, uh, I got off the bus one day and walked up the stairs to uh, International Harvester Company. They were in a warehouse on uh, Seneca Street near Alabama. And I walked up to ask them. I was still going to school at the time. And uh, let's see. 
see. I mean, yeah. Yeah, International Harvester. You know what they are. Mm -hmm. So you started working there at the warehouse? No, in the office. He gave me a typing test, which was horrible. He says, well, there won't be much typing anyway. And I was doing clerical work in the office. How did you stay with them? In the oh. door. No. No, I think it was, it was after the twins were born. Or, uh, I can't. I can't remember where the hell I, w I went from there. Well, when the twins were born, then who was the next child? Bob. Bob Jr. Robert Emmett Jr. And what year was he, he born? That would have been uh, November the 2nd, 51. October 50, November 51, yeah. Now, are you still living with Marie's uh, parents? No. Uh, we were back in we were back in Parkview. After the twins? No, the twins were born in Parkview. After we were married. Helen Ann. Helen Ann and my mother were living on the second floor of Parkview. Right. Dan and Jean Ann and were on the first floor. Right. And their tenant was moving out of the apartment. Bree and I were going to have the third floor. That was the arrangement. Well, before it happened, Helen Ann and my mother decided instead of the flat, they would take the third floor apartment, which gave Marie and I the entire first floor flat, second floor, with the energy down be a uh, great arrangement. So I'm, I'm not sure just when we, it was shortly after we were married is because the twins were born and uh, out of that flat, set, 84 Park View. So then you had Bob Jr. the following year. Yeah, we started filling up the bedrooms. And who was next? You're getting tough now. That would have been Mary Beth, Bethy. Well, there's only three bedrooms. One, place, two, right? three. Yeah, we doubled up. One, two, three. That's why six, I got the picture in case you're yeah. impression. No, that not. That was the right order. So it was the twins, then Bobby Jr., then Beth. Now, uh, where are you working at this time? Now you're supporting a family of four. No, 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 wait a minute, I don't know. Well, you're just jumping around, I, Jeff. I can't think what I did. Uh, I can't think what I did, right? Oh, whoa, 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 yeah. I left. Uh, uh, International Harvester, the office job, uh, for a root salesman job with Continental Baking. I almost forgot that. Uh, I had the little truck, looks like a mail truck, uh, today's mail truck. Uh, peddling Hostess Cupcakes, Twinkies. I didn't deal in any bread, just the cake line. 
I did that for geez, about eight years. And uh, I quit him one time to go into real estate with John Hannett. Full time, I was going. Real estate full time. Well, about two months later, I called, or three months later, I called. My supervisor from Continental Banking called. Said he had a good route open, and I said, I'll take it. <laughs> Enough for real estate? So, so I was back. Well, I still part time, but I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't make a big go of it full time. So I was back at the bakery for another four years, I guess. I don't know. I, so if you chronological had, times. And then what did you do after the bakery? I should have had this all down alphabetically. After the bakery, uh, I think I quit the bakery to go to work the second time, to go to work with my brother Ed. As uh, it would have been early 60s. Oh. I don't know, I should have had all this. No, that's all right. That's, I mean, we're just, we're just talking. So who was born after Bethy? Barbara. Barbara. That's Barbara King today. Mm -hmm. And now what year, do you remember when she was born? So, no. B Bob was no, I'm not even sure of Beth. It all ran Jane together. and Joyce was 50 and Bob was 51. And then they just kept coming. And then, <clears throat> I don't know, we got angry for a year or two and then Beth. And so, 53, 4, 53, 4, I don't know. And then Barbara. Barbara. And who's after that? Billy, 50. I think Billy was. Am I saying 57? Fifty-seven and then Michael six years later. Michael, six years later? Yeah. Sixty-three? Michael's younger than me. I was sixty-one. Cause everywhere I go in South Buffalo they say, Oh, I know your cousin Mike. Michael's the baby? Yeah. So you, how long did you live on, uh, how long did you live at 84 Park? From birth, 33 years. Moved over to Shenandoah in December 58. Into this house? Yeah. That's right. 44 years. Yeah. You've been in this house. It isn't dead yet, is it? Well, December. So, yeah. where Barb and Beth were born on Parkview? They all were, but, but Michael had to be. Yeah. So it was getting a little crowded then. It was time to get a bigger place. Yeah. Right, right. Well, we were maturing enough too. We wanted a place of our own. And uh, my brother-in-law, Dan Hannon, was listing this property or had it listed. And I always liked the name Shenandoah. When we were kids, our cousins, the Starks, lived in Shenandoah, still do. And uh, when we'd come over to visit there, visit them for a Sunday dinner or a holiday or something, boy, it just was really living. All the flat lawns, 
No hills. You mean that hill that you had on um, Parkview? Yeah. Mm. Flat lawns and, and just the name Shenandoah. I don't know. It, it sounded more poetic or something than Seneca Street. <laughs> or Buffalo. Or Parkview. Yeah. <laughs> Buffalo had a nice soft sound to it. Eh? So now, Dan, so your so your sister Jean. And Dan Hannon moved out. And then you moved out of Parkview? No, I think we moved downstairs. And Helen and Bud well, moved in, one of them, right? I don't, I don't think so. I think they bought the house around and Oh, no, no, they, 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 were in Parkview. they were in Parkview and then, were they? Park, and then well, I just interviewed Dad. They were in Parkview? Yeah. The apartment or the flat? No, right, I think I think in the apartment. I think all the way up on the third floor they started in. Went in the back room with Nana, where Nana was in the front. But did you, now, so how many, Gus, now, it's, it's year 2002, how many grandchildren, you had the twins, Bob, Beth and Barbara, and Michael, six kids? Nice Billy, one. Billy. Billy. Billy's after Barbara? Yeah. Okay, and then, so seven kids, and how many grandchildren? By this picture, you got quite a few. Well, why, don't you, why don't you hold that? No, we, we, we count 15 grandchildren. 15? Why don't you yeah. hold this? I'll zoom in on this. And just hold that right in front of you. you got to stop moving, bud. Oh. <laughs> I'm just getting a reflection. Why well, move the picture? Pardon? I can move the picture for a reflection. Yeah, just put it right in front of you. There you, there you go. And that's the whole family there. Well, yeah, and there's extras there too. Now they got extras too. Okay, that's good. You can put that aside. You got Ronnie's, Stanky's uh, mother in there. Oh, that's the only extra, I guess. So, only Billy's ex-wife and his kids, or okay. her kids. All right, why don't you put that down a second. And let me ask you, we're just about finished here. So if your rear end's hurting, that's okay. No. <laughs> so, let me ask you, if you want to say anything to your grandchildren and your grandchildren's children, about the war, about your life, about anything. What would it be? Your kids, your family, anything. Because someday they'll have this interview and they'll just look, look at it. And the great grandfather they never knew. Well, there's nothing very profound I can come up with. Very profound. I don't know what. Did you have fun in your life? What I can say. Oh yeah, and I made some mistakes, and I forgot most of those. I forgot many of the good times. But a nun told me one time. She repeated over and over. Pray to Saint Joseph. Just ask him to make you a good husband and father. And I've tried to do that. Uh, but I've, uh, I give up, I, I've given up on the prayer end of it. I think about him occasionally, but I, uh, 
I don't do much praying anymore. But just try to be a good husband and father. Or a good wife and mother. <laughs> I have nothing very profound to say. That's profound enough, Gus. Yeah. That's profound enough. Listen, thanks a lot. And I'm just going to shut it down. You can say goodbye now. Goodbye, y'all. Look at the camera. <laughs> I wish I could look at Nana <sighs> and hear a tape like this on Nana, and you're on. So say goodbye to your family. Goodbye, y'all. Keep in touch.